Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Tokyo on Fire. Today is October 27th, 2016. On Monday, the Japanese received terrific news. One more Nobel laureate was announced, Dr. Yoshinori Osumi, a physiologist. Nancy, what do you think about this terrific news? It's a big deal in Japan, actually, the way they look at the Nobel laureates, almost like a sport competition. It's on TV. They, they're waiting for it. Right, right. Uh, that's very differently played in other countries, in particular in the U.S., and I think it's a part of Japan's nation brand mm -hmm. to really value science, uh, the emphasis they put on research and technology. But when you dig a little deeper, it appears that a lot of the research has taken place perhaps decades before. And there's some worry about going forward if they will have younger researchers uh, being able to win these prizes because universities are having to cut some of their R&D and, and aren't able to hire researchers due to the decline in the student population mm -hmm. in part. But the real, the person I am uh, delighted with was the uh, previous Nobel laureate. The 2014? One, right. And he's my favorite maverick of the week. And that would be Shuji Nakamura who spoke recently at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. I he has a bit it. of a bee in his bonnet, doesn't he? He does, and he he really is focused on the, the fact that uh, despite his win, there are a lot of entrenched problems in Japan having to do with uh, not enough emphasis on publication in English, uh, that the Japanese economy he thinks should just collapse and that they need to start all over again. <laughs> of course, he had to sue in, in order to get compensated because originally, I guess, the, the recipients law, right. were getting $10,000 and the Even Japanese- 10,000 yen. 10,000 yen. Which is 100 bucks. Oh, that's awful. Yes, I've got 10,000 <laughs> no. yen in my purse right now. He has plenty to, to complain about. <laughs> Obviously. He does. And of course, he, he fled the country. He became a U.S. citizen. He's now at UC Santa Barbara. Right. And he's got a great sense of humor because he said on the benefits of winning a Nobel Prize, he doesn't have to teach anymore. He has a parking space. And he is at the University of California, though, having lived in California. That's its own bonus. Right. <laughs> but I just love that he he's really sort of taken it to them, and, and he's in a position to do so. Mm -hmm. And um, as a researcher, non-scientific, social science researcher, I think that uh, in terms of womenomics, we need to see more women coming into the fore here because women researchers uh, are in the low, like 12, 13 uh, percent overall of, of research faculty at universities. And I didn't realize that until 10 years ago, they didn't even have tenure track at the Japanese university. So the Japanese universities have been run very differently mm -hmm. than what is normally the track that one takes to be lauded in the end. So, But the, but Nobel prizes help in all things having to do with that. It helps in order to attract children mm -hmm. to studying science. Mm -hmm. It helps Talk, it allows the, uh, the professors to talk to bureaucrats and politicians and say, this is what we need to change in order to get more out of our universities. Mm -hmm. So the Nobel Prizes for Japan are, yes, they're, they're great in terms of PR, right. in terms of country branding, mm. but internally, they're great for education. They're great for new and in innovative programs at universities that, and also, it, 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 there have not been yet Nobel Prize winners who are women, right? And that is something that is the next step, I mm -hmm. think, for in this entire process. Well, and who was the woman they were talking about as being on track, possibly to get a Nobel? Was the one who ended up being involved in the controversy around uh, doctoring some of the data? Oh, that's right. right. That's true. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there talk about her that oh, this could be if the discovery that she announced was actually replicable? Yes. Yeah. But That's it was, right. but it wasn't, and you're yeah. right that that was that is. It was more like an op-ed research <laughs> <laughs> platform. Well, she certainly did make it hard, and in certainly by by making it extremely feminine. You remember she would not wear a lab coat; she would wear a hapogi, right. yeah, and and, and uh, all these bizarre things. She had characters on on her research equipment and all this these unnecessary things. That's true. 
Mm-hmm. And her supervisor committed suicide. That's right. right. Who is yeah. this uh, lady? I've forgotten her name. Anyway, um, I'm not sure. Okay. okay well, we won't. We won't, we won't go okay. into that. But I, I think that's great, though, if you can have more dialogue between university professors mm-hmm. and universities in general and the government, because there are a lot of problems at the university. The foreign faculty numbers are few. And then we also, I know from working at a university, if you don't have command of the language, you're not really hired for that. Right. You often get all of your communication in mm-hmm. Japanese. So they don't really have in place this bilingual this sort of welcoming kind well, it's of It's not even onboarding. bilingual. It's, it's world English. That's right. right. The term that's that you right. use. And, exactly. I, and I think that's entirely global yeah. English, which is right. the language of international academia, right. in, international business, that yeah. you have to, to work in that. Sure. I mean, when we, when we go to our various meetings here in Tokyo, the European nations could, of course, insist on having their meetings in German or their mm-hmm. meetings in French, but they don't mm-hmm. right. because it's global English. Right, right. right. I could handle the German, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Give me a good German beer and I get much more fluent. So <laughs> You had a few just before this filming, didn't no, you? No, 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 no. That deny, deny. Okay. I've got my coffee right here. <laughs> One of the things I like about Professor Osumi is that he has been toiling away for 28 years. He is your typical quintessential otaku. He's mm. just, he's into his his thing. And he's been doing it unobserved, unannounced until just recently. And he's made some really incredible discoveries about uh, how yeast cells interact with each other. And of course, I cannot identify with that toiling away anywhere in obscurity for 28 yeah. years. So I really hand it to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also that it's an argument that pure science matters. Uh, he He started out as did most of the uh, researchers, not thinking about the commercial implications. And that's, mm-hmm. uh, that's a break with the way science is usually run right. here. Applied science is very much funded, very much pursued, uh, the pursuit of patents, but simply pure science just trying to work out what, why something works the way uh-huh. it does. Uh, sure, there are big government projects such as the one that resulted in the physics prizes uh, where you have an enormous the the, the Kamio Kande uh, facility that that requires governments to be involved but in in most of the time in Japan you want to do science you're going to do corporate science mm-hmm. science that's applied well what's the deal here I mean uh, for such a long period of time since the Nobel Prize was first um, created uh, the Japanese were almost non-existent and then just over the last 20 years, we've got to, what, 22 uh, it's Nobel It's the laureates. water, it's I'm the, sure. Yeah. Well, there's, there's certainly also a national pride issue at hand. Mm. I mean, you can certainly see every time a Japanese name has been announced, and, the, and it's been several years in a row now, that there has been at least one Japanese researcher, if not at, mm-hmm. at times three of them at once. You, you know that they're looking immediately and they say, Hi, Beijing. Where are yours? Yes, that's true. <laughs> Where are right. your noblists? Uh-huh. And there's certainly a great deal of national pride in that as mm-hmm. well. And you know, to his point about science for science sake, it right. got me thinking about when I worked at the U.S. Information Agency, a cultural affairs agency. And we were asked, this was during the Clinton administration in the 90s, during the big push for NAFTA, to link everything we did culturally to some type of commercial Mm -hmm. interests because the U.S. wanted to engage in the newly democratizing countries of the the former Soviet Union and other countries as well in Latin America and elsewhere. And I felt the way the Nobel recipient feels in the sense that why not culture for its own sake? Why do we have to tie it so often to commercial corporate ends? Because Mm -hmm. he's a great example of having that payoff at the end, but he worries that if it's all commercial, then it, people can kind of get maybe a little bit sloppy and away from some of the fundamentals of, of science. Mm-hmm. So I just thought of that analogy is that we're kind of quick to look at the profit angle. And if you link it to the fact that the Japanese government wants to get all the profit in the end, I know it does have to do a lot with national pride. My understanding is there are more patents awarded to Japan. Is it the highest in the world? Not, or? not anymore, but it, okay. at one time it certainly was one right. of their goals. Mm-hmm. So during the downturn, the so-called lost decades, they can say, yeah, but look at how strong we are in the sciences. 
The worry, though, is that there are some surveys of young people who are not showing the same interest right. in science. And these are recent surveys where they just don't have the excitement towards science the way that neighboring countries have. So you, you really have got to wonder where the next generation will come. Right. But then that's, that's what makes the current crop of noblists so important for right. Japan in the long term because they're all mentors. That's mm -hmm. right. And th it, it becomes very clear that if you learn from these mentors, you will be on a track. And, and many of the, the most recent uh, recipients point back to previous Nobelists and say, it's because of so-and-so in the background, mm -hmm. in the past, that I was able, or persons who were eligible for the Nobel who passed away before being mm -hmm. awarded. So that th the lineages within Japan's academic community are being carried on, and that bodes well for Japan in the future, I think. Maybe so. I mean, yeah. it could be characteristic that these uh, Nobel laureates for the Japanese are part of the baby boom, and they're tapering off, and the doldrums that the Japanese are in now, just they don't have the energy or the insight or the motivation to pursue these kinds of activities as you know their fathers or their uncles did. Well, it's certainly that, 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 that's one argument you could make, but you can also say that Japan has a really deep bench, and it's getting deeper. Even though the number of young people it has shrunk by half. Mm -hmm. The number of people who go to college now has doubled over that same period of time. So you have, still have that same college educated, then ready to go into possibly into graduate school pool that it's, that it's had over the last 30 years. And that's good going forward. Right, right. But you do have to ask yourself, why are young people maybe turning away from the sciences when there's so many more opportunities now in the so-called hard sciences than in my social sciences. Mm -hmm. So for instance, for women and minorities, STEM is so big now, and uh, technology, science, education. You can get major fellowships and scholarships if you are part of underrepresented uh, populations. So I just in wonder- the In the United States. Okay, in no. the US, but yeah, Japan is a different case. There's, Although, there's, there's no, there, I can assure you that there's no advancement for women or for- Koreans. In general, so, exactly. Yeah. Yes, I know all too well. But uh, I think that things are changing, of course, politically. So we're, will there be that kind of trickle down mm -hmm. effect that if women see uh, women in positions of power politically, then maybe they'll they'll say, "Hey, I can do this." Because mm -hmm. sometimes I think it's just a matter of, "Do you have the self confidence? Could you have a mentor, a male mentor, really inspire a young woman to say, hey, yeah, I've got the the brains to do this.'" I, I'm reminded of Larry Summers years ago, the Harvard University professor who got in some hot water when he was making a speech and. He sort he of alluded to, of the that's time. right, president of Harvard at the time. And he was saying that we know that women's brains are maybe not as suited for the sciences and, and mathematics, maybe. Um, now, of course, he pulled that back later and, and said, you got to look him. at the whole speech. <laughs> but uh, as the daughter of a scientist or in applied scientists and engineering, I, I wish that I could have had that chance to do it all over again mm -hmm. because just the having visited OIST last fall, the Okinawa uh, Graduate School Institute for Science and Technology, sort of an MIT-like university, it was there that I was so inspired by these international scholars, including many women mm -hmm. from around the world. So there's a lot of really wonderful things happening in science, and it's one area where I think, in a way, we can see the peaceful uses of that science, that it doesn't always have to go toward building bombs. Sure. Or, and that comes up with your, your op-ed. That's right. right. I did an op-ed about uh, the Manhattan Project, talk about scientists, and uh, they, they were putting the best minds, including Albert Einstein, toward building the atomic bombs. Your piece bombs. appeared in the yes. Japan Times. That's where it is. And, yeah. uh, I, you know, this was on the heels of this marketing conference, the World Business Conference on World Peace at, in Hiroshima. And since Japan is known so strongly in science and technology, uh, do we want it to really go in the direction of more peaceful means and to use that peace brand right. in the service of society? 
the internet came out of science research. So, mm -hmm. so much uh, we've really benefited from as end users and our smartphones, all of this is science. Right. And so I, I just hope that there will be more young people to really embrace this field. Mm -hmm. The fellow that uh, we talked about earlier, uh, the professor in uh, Santa Barbara, Dr. Nakamura, uh, he created with uh, two other people, the, the diode that produces a, a, a light using very little electricity, and he feels like he was burned. He challenged that. No pun intended. No, right? no pun intended. <laughs> he, he challenged that. He did get a payout, and the first thing he did was he left Japan. And now mm -hmm. from his position there, he can throw stones at, at the Japanese, and he is doing that, but he becomes something of an unwanted gadfly as, yes, a, as exactly. a result of that. You mentioned the fellow who wrote Straight Jacket Society mm. in a, an episode or two ago, uh, Dr. Snow. And I think the same thing happens to those kinds of people who point out the obvious flaws in the system and the way things are done and become kind of pariahs as a Well, if you're, if you're going to point them out, you have to be proactive. You have to offer something that is positive because you don't want to just be critical for its own sake to make yourself that gadfly, as right. you said, that's somebody who can clear a room because people sort of roll their eyes and say, okay, what's he going to throw at us now? But in his position, I, again, I love that he's so refreshingly kind of non-Japanese, maybe in his way, but he has taken it to a bit of an extreme, even becoming a U.S. citizen. Right. I was so intrigued by that. Right. Japan's latest Nobel laureate, Dr. Yoshinori Osumi. Will it help younger Japanese get into the sciences? Please stay tuned.